Good evening and welcome to the Cumberland Historical Society program tonight. Uh, before we get into the program, I just want to uh, update people about the uh, upcoming programs this summer. On the 26th of May, there will be Cemetery Billboard Monuments of 1800 by uh, Ron Romano, right? Uh, in June, on the 23rd, Barnes of Maine. The 28th of July, A History of Maine Railroads. On the 25th of August, Maine and the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. On the 22nd of September, The French and Indian War. On the 27th of October, Historic Taverns and Tea Rooms. And on the 17th of November, Travels and Tourism in Yarmouth's 19th and 20th centuries. So, uh, got a lot of interesting programs as usual. Kathy does such a wonderful job. Tonight's program is the story of Frances Perkins, the first woman to serve as Secretary of Labor. She was instrumental for getting unemployment insurance, Social Security, and a minimum wage enacted for the first time in our history. Visiting her grandparents each summer in Maine prepared her for a life full of historic gains. Please welcome Michael Cheney of the Francis Perkins Center, located in Damascotta, who will tell us the story of this remarkable woman from Maine. Uh, Mr. Cheney is the executive director uh, as of 2014. He's a native of Alna, Maine. Uh, he earned a BA in history from the University of Maine in 1979 an MA in history with a certificate in public history and archival management from the University of Connecticut in 1985. And for four years, he worked at the Yarmouth History Center. It is my pleasure to present Mr. Cheney. Thank you very much. Welcome. Well, thank you for that uh, introduction and uh, congratulations to the Cumberland uh, Historical Society for embarking on in-person programming. I have to tell you that the last time that I spoke on behalf of the Francis Perkins Center uh, to a public audience was the York County Senior College back in February of 2020. So it's been a long 14 months uh, since um, I've been able to uh, engage with an audience. And uh, your um, broadcast over community television will also get this program uh, out to more people. But happy to be here, and um, thank you for, uh, for having us. This program is called The Life and Legacy of Francis Perkins. And what I'm going to do is uh, tell you a little bit about the uh, the video program you'll see. We produced this program uh, two years ago, and this is based on our senior college presentations, both in Portland and in Brunswick. Um, we had developed back in 2014 a five-part senior college senior college um, uh, program. And the four people that are interviewed in this uh, video are the faculty for that program, in addition to myself. Uh, Leah Sprague uh, is a founding uh, board member of the Francis Perkins Center. And she herself was a judge uh, in the Massachusetts uh, court system. So was a person who joined the bar uh, uh, at a time when there were not very many women uh, in that uh, in that profession. You'll also hear from Christopher Bryseth, who was a graduate student at Cornell University back in the early 1960s and knew Francis Perkins personally for about three years. And uh, it was his idea to invite her as a faculty in residence to become part of uh, Telluride House so that she could live on campus with free uh, room and board and do her teaching. She worked until she was 85 years old when she passed away in 1965. Uh, Charles Wazanski is another presenter. Uh, he is a retired attorney with the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office. He is the son of 
uh, Charles E. Wysansky, Jr., who served as Francis Perkins Solicitor General uh, in the Labor Department, and he is the attorney that wrote the legislation for Social Security, and he ultimately defended it before the Supreme Court uh, after its passage. And then the final uh, presenter is uh, Sarah Peskin, who is chair of our board, and uh, it looks at uh, arts, infrastructure, and uh, public works projects that were developed in the New Deal. So we will go into the into the, the video program, and then afterward, I want to tell you a little bit more about the Francis Perkins Center and the Francis Perkins Homestead National Historic Landmark, a 57-acre property that we own in Newcastle, Maine. And you'll learn a little bit more about her main roots uh, in this program. So we will go to the video. to history. Why is it that all of us have studied U.S. history? Many, many, many people that we, we've talked with and that we do our educational programs for have never heard of her. Frances Perkins was a self-made woman. She was not given anything. She made herself what she became. She was the woman behind the New Deal. There are things that we take for granted. Social security, old age pension, the minimum wage, the 40 hour work week, the ban on child labor. These were all her ideas. is really um, uh, transformational, inspirational. Uh, she was a pioneer in many ways. She met with FDR when he asked her to be the Secretary of Labor, and she told him uh, she was very reluctant about taking the job. She told him she would take it, provided he would back her on this list of what she called the practical possibilities. All of these things were her pro programs, her policies that she wanted initiated, and he said that he would. And she did it. Um, all of these programs that she laid out as a condition for her, her employment in the, as the first woman in the cabinet uh, were fulfilled except for universal health care. And we all know that we're still debating what that is, whether or not it's the fact that she was a woman, uh, whether or not it was the fact that events overtook FDR and his administration, namely the war, it became very important. But for some reason, she has been left out of many of the history books. And we start with the New Deal and what happened after the inauguration in March of 1933 and, and think about all the accomplishments in Washington. However, she led an incredible life before then. In the last semester, she took a course in uh, the history of industrialism in England and America, taught by Professor Ingo Sewell. And this had a tremendous influence upon her because Professor Sewell required her students to go into the factories uh, in neighboring Holyoke along the Connecticut River and see the actual working conditions there. Fanny Perkins, as she was known at the time, was shocked. 
she later looked back and said, you know, this was really a formative experience. Women worked extraordinary long hours. Children were working in these factories. There were no benefits to any of them if, if they were injured, and, and there were some serious injuries that occurred. She tried to get a job in social work in New York, really concerned about working in an area where she might be able to do something to, uh, to deal with poverty. She changed her religious faith from the Congregational Church to the Episcopalian faith, and she changed her name from Fanny Coralie Perkins, which was her birth name, to Frances Perkins. You could certainly see that someone with the kind of ambition that she was developing probably thought that Fanny wasn't a good name for a woman to go through life. She moved out of this work as a social worker Jane Addams Hull House in Chicago. And then she went to Philadelphia where she worked with immigrant women prostitutes and went to work. And then she went to Columbia, New York, became part of the National Consumer League. And from that world, and she was part of the Gold Moose movement, uh, she carried that tradition of the progressive Gold Moose candidate, candidate. candidate to Theodore Roosevelt through the whole era of She's the only person that connects that entire tradition from TR to FDR. Um, and those ideas become the program for Al Smith as governor as, as New York approaches the Great Depression. And of course, the ideas come out of the fact that the Investigating Commission that follows the Triangle Fire. On March 25, 1911, she was having tea at a friend's house uh, near Washington Square in Greenwich Village, and they heard the fire alarms ringing, and they ran to see, uh, as, and she watched in horror uh, the events uh, of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, so she was a witness to it. She, she watched the women, young women, immigrant women, jump to their deaths to the, to the street below. It was a horrific event, and it, it, people in New York were very concerned about making sure that this didn't happen again. She said later that it was the day the New Deal was born. She becomes the de facto executive of the Factory Investigating Commission, which is a legislative commission, on Smith's recommendation. He was head of the House of the Assembly, Robert Wagner was head of the Senate, these two men would be pivotal to her career and to the country. And the two of them hire her on the recommendation of Theodore Roosevelt. So she actually gets kind of tapped by the great progressive Theodore Roosevelt and then becomes this consequential leader of policy for Governor Al Smith. And in January 1930, uh, Hoover came out with a bunch of employment statistics which said things were getting better. And Ms. Perkins knew they weren't. She went to her colleagues from the different states and asked for their unemployment statistics. And without asking Roosevelt, she called a press conference. She challenged the President of the United States, his data was wrong. In fact, our point was getting worse. She then called up Roosevelt and she said, are you in a good mood? He said, why, Francis? She said, because I've done something very bad. He said, if you'd asked me, I would have said no. But, and if there's any kickback on this, you're gonna have to absorb it. Which is kind of characteristic of the, how he dealt with the entire time. She, he would back her to do her thing, but if it got into trouble, as with his later with his impeachment in 1939, he said nothing. He, he let her squirm in public. Well, what, what that did to Governor Roosevelt, who all of a sudden he made, he became the lead governor dealing with the Depression. She then had him have a conference of governors to deal with the unemployment situation. 
So Roosevelt goes into uh, 32, and he's not the obvious candidate, but his record as a governor was the best in the nation, because of Francis. She learned her ropes as a practical, pragmatic politician. She learned how to manipulate people. She discovered in that that the Tammany men uh, felt much more comfortable with her if they thought of their mother. And that's when she changed her clothing. She was trying to figure out how she could make the best impression upon these men and decided that all of them had mothers. So she would start looking matronly and she began wearing dark clothes, um, black grays, um, and loose fitting clothes so that her youthful body didn't appear. Uh, she became very friendly with uh, two important figures in New York history. Uh, Al Smith, who was an assemblyman at the time, and Robert Wagner. They were relationships that she would build on for many years after that. She also uh, knew how to get things done. She knew how to work the system, and she depended upon a lot of allies in, in the Tammany Hall gang of, of uh, representatives in, in New York State. Just as she had for Al Smith, she became a key advisor to, to Governor Roosevelt. They were very concerned about issues of unemployment. The Great Depression was just about to hit, uh, as we know, in October of 29 with the, the uh, stock market crash. FDR was elected president in 1932. There was groundbreaking legislation, not only in the first 100 days, but thereafter. In 1938, that was conditions for things that she wanted to achieve if she were to be the Labor Secretary became the Fair Labor Standards Act, and it included the fine old pieces of labor legislation that we still have today. The minimum wage, the 40-hour work week, the ban on child labor, um, added that to all of the accomplishments of Social Security, unemployment compensation, workman's compensation, old age, pensions, and aid to, to needy families with children. So that when Roosevelt died in April of 1945, Collier's Magazine did an article about Francis Perkins, and it said, this has not been so much the Roosevelt New Deal as the Perkins New Deal. My father's association with Francis Perkins began in a very fortuitous way. That is to say, Francis Perkins and FDR requested of Felix Frankfurt the name of someone who might best assist her as solicitor. She learned not only that he had been an extraordinary student at Harvard Law School, but that he had refused to work at Ropes and Gray on a labor injunction case which would have enjoined labor from Pekin. And in doing so, she realized that he had principles which conformed to what she believed in, and she was confident that he would be of assistance when he came to Washington. And my father simply showed up in Washington along with many others who were hired as a result of Felix Franklin's recommendation, some 60 happy hot dogs, as they were called. And there, he was immediately put to work in a way that he had never expected. Initially, his assessment of Francis Perkins was rather harsh. He came from a very uh, establishment uh, legal background. And over time, he realized that this would not be enough. So I think he minimized her understanding of the problems and how it was that the government should proceed, in part because she was a woman, but also because she came from a different discipline and one which he had not at that point learned to respect. Years later, after he had become a judge, he came to realize that his arguments in the Supreme Court were not as adequate as they should have been because they did not take into account the larger perspective that Francis Perkins so clearly had of the role of 
government and the need for a national approach to problems that could not be handled on a more local level. Ms. Perkins successively assigned him bills to draft and then had him accompany her to various labor meetings and uh, disputes and he became increasingly important to her. At a certain point, she needed the drafting of the Social Security Act and it was to him and he in turn, my father hired Norm Elliott who drafted the Social Security Act which became so important as Ms. Perkins' perhaps most important legacy. He, on her behalf, was asked to help devise a means to undercut the State Department's attempt to limit Jewish immigration from Nazi Germany. And my father was able to devise a bond procedure whereby a rotating fund became available to would-be immigrants and they would come to this country and after they were established that same money would be used to bring in others and so the immigration process increased tremendously and Francis Perkins was severely criticized by the State Department and by others for her actions in this sense and I think that among other things, made my father realize what a humanitarian, what a egalitarian this woman was. Miss Perkins, on reconsideration after 40 years, and he was writing this not long before he died at age 80, Miss Perkins stands out as one of the noblest, strongest characters I've ever encountered. On Social Security, she had a vision which was as practical as it was far-sighted. Somehow, she got along with patricians, bankers, socialites, and the older Democrats because she was not a swell. She had been brought up with them. She irritated congressmen and journalists and often labor leaders of the old style. She got along best with Jews, Henry Moskowitz, Isidore Lubin, Gilman, her secretary, Francis Jerkowitz, and me. So there is a very important transition in my father's thinking. And I would suggest, at least, that we as a country should need to make a similar transition to understand the importance of this woman because she really transformed our understanding and began to proceed in a way which has so much influenced the direction of this country. Well, Francis Perkins was teaching industrial labor relations school, and I was head of the resident guest committee, and I said, why don't we ask her to dinner? And from there, I began thinking, you know, we should think about her as a permanent guest. So before that spring was out, we invited her to another dinner. We took her upstairs to the room, the corner room, which her key was. And I said, now, Miss Perkins, I don't want you to say yes tonight, but you should think about this. We are very noisy. We're very messy. You're right over the music room. It will be Bach, Bartok, and Bubek all hours of the night, and we're not going to change if you come. Um, she said, how much will it cost? And I said, oh, we're all here for we're all room and board. And her eyes lit up. Um, and now we know from Kirsten Downey's book just how poor she was in terms of the demands on her resources because of her husband's illness and, and so forth. So she, um, she rode home with Morris Neufeld, who was her boss, the ILR school. She said, do you know what those boys have done, Morris? He said, yes, Miss Perkins. She said, I feel like a bride on her wedding night. I guess you can't say that Miss Perkins is one of the boys, 
but she certainly was a totally comfortable person with us. There was a sense of merriment about her that her eyes twinkled. Even when she was feeling the physical distress, she could come on uh, to the rest of us. She was terribly grateful to be living with us. I mean, we never felt she was suffering by being with us. She did find us messy. There was candor, but never did she, was she like her mother. She was not a housewife in any way. When she was alone with me talking, uh, there was no barrier between us. I mean, she, she entered into our lives. She asked questions about us that were as, every bit as interested in who we were as we were interested in who she was. So she was a very accessible person. She had often had her rug gloves. Sometimes she's holding one in, in, in her gloved hand. On the other hand, she's just, just sitting there. So she, she projected force when she spoke, even in her 80s. And I think part of her skill as a woman in that all-male environment was that she really had figured out the male ego. She brought expertise, which they counted on and depended on. And uh, she survived all the, the, the slings and arrows of her career, which were many. Frances Perkins died in 1965. She was 85 years old. She was still teaching at, at Cornell at the time. She was legally blind and worked right up till the end. She had a sense of place. One of the sense, the story she told about her grandmother saying that if whatever comes your way, if you pretend nothing has happened. So when that tomato came in with the white blouse at the Al Smith uh, rally in Missouri in 1928, she thought of her grandmother and said, just keep talking. Francis just kept Francis Perkins described the New Deal as an attitude that a government should aim to give all the people under its jurisdiction the best possible life. And when she said that, she didn't just mean economic security through jobs and laws and laws that would guarantee safe working conditions, but she was thinking also about public infrastructure, the roads and highways and bridges that we use, and also many works of art. Now, Frances Perkins' role in this period is critical, but it's not very well known. This was a time that saw the creation of something called a people's art, according to Rockwell Kent. The most important thing, though, is that there was a real concern at this time during the Great Depression that a whole generation of artists would be lost because there was no work for anyone, and particularly not for artists. This administration had several different aims. They were very interested, of course, in the economic security, but they also wanted to lift the spirits of people. And in promoting the arts programs, as well as the relief and infrastructure programs, they were able to do both. The very first of the New Deal arts programs, it was called the Public Works of Art, and it was uh, begun in 1933. Valley Farms by Ralph Dickinson, another that um, uh, called The Apple Vendor by Barbara Stevenson. I kept noticing that many of them came from the Department of Labor. These were paintings that were collected and assembled personally by Francis Perkins as part of this program, she was actually the impetus behind artists being included in the New Deal programs. The idea was that there were out-of-work artists. Should they be employed in digging ditches? No, they should just be working at what they did best. And the idea was pretty straightforward to have artists decorate federal buildings that were under construction which promoted 
the beginning of some of the great mural projects, but as well, they were trying to simply advance the careers and help out the artists who were working. So they did a kind of an experimental one-year program, and they had a show at the Corcoran Gallery, and she chose 130 of the paintings from the show and had them placed in the Department of Labor, which didn't have walls suitable for murals. And these became part of the collection, the permanent collection of the Smithsonian, and you can see them today. Some of the massive uh, infrastructure projects in the country, the, the bridges and dams, like the Grand Coulee Dam, here we have the Deer Isle Bridge. These were all built during the New Deal, and they're still in use today. appropriations that covered the infrastructure programs, the $3.7 billion for the Public Works Administration, because that was a major initiative. And I guess the main point to be made here is that this program was massive, it continued, it was everywhere in the country, and it affected everyone. Uh, there was another program that she was a very key participant in, and that was the Civilian Conservation Corps. This is considered one of the model programs and most successful ones of the New Deal. She was able to get 250,000 men in the field in temporary housing for training. Many of these camps actually were in Maine, and it's part of the Maine legacy as well as the Civilian Conservation Corps. The program was basically fairly simple. The young men were recruited, they were trained, they earned $30 a month, they sent 25 of that back home and kept $5 of it. They planted trees, they helped in flood control, they helped with emergencies and insect eradication. The Civilian Conservation Corps crews actually built a substantial number of the structures and features of Acadia National Park. They also built many of the state parks that we know and enjoy today. Because many of these are frescoes in post offices where people went every single day. The art process became part of the community life of towns and cities all across the country. Rockwell Kent is one of the most interesting artists of this period. He has some very strong associations with Maine, but in addition, he was chosen to paint a mural series in the Washington, D.C. Central Post Office. It's called Mail Service to the Arctic and Mail Service to the Tropics. He was an activist, he was outspoken, he was very controversial, but he received this important federal commission. He did also do a beautiful mural that I think exemplifies the best of both the New Deal and FDR administration. It's actually installed in the Longworth Federal Office Building in a hearing room, and it exists today. He said, the purpose of the arts projects, the furnishing of employment to workers in the various cultural fields throughout the period of the Depression, had been accomplished. The artists had been kept alive. The arts themselves had not only been kept alive, but put in service to the people, had been reinvigorated to such a degree as to mark that period as one of a renaissance, no more than that, a birth of a truly Native American art with all the characteristics of subject, the American scene, and of method, realism, that are not only proper, but absolutely essential to the art of a democracy.
Well, there's a lot to Francis Perkins, and we're very happy to have brought uh, the, the different perspectives on her life uh, to you in the what is usually a five-week course. Um, we continue to answer the question, why was Francis Perkins lost to history? Why did we not know about her? Why did we not know about her main origins? And Chris Bryce has touched on one thing uh, a bit. If you believe the old adage that uh, the journalists have the first cut at history, uh, Frances Perkins did not have a very good relationship uh, with what she referred to as the newspaper boys. And it was because she was protective of her personal space, her husband who had a chronic illness, and her young daughter. Um, her husband and daughter remained in New York where they were getting adequate care while she uh, went to Washington to work for FDR. She was also um, the first woman to serve in a president's cabinet, and that was not wet, met with uh, universal acceptance um, at that time. And uh, also because of her work, uh, uh, particularly uh, when the Labor Department had responsibility for immigration and naturalization, she was the person responsible for immigration policy uh, on behalf of the Roosevelt administration. And the controversy around immigration, does that sound familiar to today? Um, uh, <coughs> caused uh, the State Department uh, to push at Roosevelt and eventually uh, responsibility for immigration and naturalization was shifted to the Department of Justice, uh, taken away from the Labor Department because of the disagreement uh, from the State Department about uh, immigration policy, particularly as it related uh, to uh, the uh, Jewish refugees from uh, Nazi Germany. Charles Wazanski's points about understanding her not from a legal perspective but from a humanitarian perspective um, is, is key. And we're having the same debate today. What is the proper role for the federal government in ensuring that everyone has uh, the um, best possible life? And uh, from one side of the political spectrum to the other, uh, it can be a larger role for the federal government, or it can be a smaller role and let the economic system uh, take care of all of, uh, all of our citizens. If you read Kirsten Downey's book, you'll understand that the economic system has its ups and downs. It has its booms and busts. And with the Great Depression uh, in the 30s, that was the third or fourth or even fifth downward turn in this economic system based on capitalism. If you have the capital, if you have the wealth, if you're running the large corporations, you can weather the ups and downs of the economy. What Perkins understood is that the individual family, the individual worker, did not have the ability to weather uh, when your job disappeared. When your job disappeared, 
a, a whole cascade of things happened. You couldn't feed your family properly. You'd lose your farm or your home to taxes because you couldn't pay your taxes. And uh, uh, it, it, there needed to be a shock absorber system of some sort to, to provide relief during the ups and downs of the economic system. Uh, a couple of other points about Frances Perkins is that she was regarded uh, from her days uh, really with the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. She was regarded as an expert on uh, worker safety and worker uh, protection issues in general. She began her work in earnest with that investigating commission that uh, TR uh, suggested that she be appointed to and became known across the country for investigating the situation that resulted in the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire and came up with recommendations for how to prevent that from happening again. And it's very simple common sense things. Do not lock your workers in the factory with no ability for them to get out. Do not leave scraps of cloth and clothing and uh, t textile material in trash cans uh, where if there were a fire, there would be even more fuel to start the fire. Um, fire escapes. Um, all of the common sense things that we know today uh, that protect workers' uh, physical uh, safety, their health, uh, and ultimately their income uh, should uh, their jobs disappear. Uh, the other thing that she found profoundly unfair at this point in time was that just because you're too old to work doesn't mean that you shouldn't be taken care of in your retirement years. And the genius of the Social Security system is that you put in your own money with every paycheck so that there is something for you to fall back on uh, after you're no longer working. Before then, if you, could, if you were no longer able to work, the money stopped coming in. And your sons and daughters and, grands and grandchildren and other family members had to take care of you. Otherwise, again, you lost the farm and a feature across Maine uh, back in those days was the poor farm. That is where people went when they lost their homes to taxes. And, uh, so she, um, she just recognized something that was just fundamentally wrong in her mind, and she spent her career uh, uh, correcting that. Um, the other thing that people don't uh, f fully recognize is her family connection to Maine. Um, the Francis Perkins Center was founded back in 2010, and just last year, uh, January of 2020, uh, we were able to purchase the Francis Perkins Homestead from her grandson, Tomlin Perkins Coggeshall, her last remaining heir. That farmstead in Newcastle is on the Damariscotta River. It currently consists of 57 acres, and has been in the Perkins family since 1745. And they were settlers uh, in the pre-revolutionary period, settled on the banks of the Damariscotta, and through the revolutionary period and the 19th century, three Perkins brothers uh, operated uh, that property and had a significant uh, brickyard operation uh, for close to 100 years, ending in 1895. And, um, but the family continued to operate the farm. Once the brick industry left, um, two of the brothers had to move elsewhere because that subsistence family farm could not sh support three households. So Francis Perkins' parents uh, moved first to Boston and then ultimately settled in Worcester. Um, and uh, Francis was born there. But every uh, summer came back to Newcastle to be with her grandmother. And that house was built in 1837 
for Francis's grandmother as a wedding present uh, from her parents. And uh, the brick house that we refer to today uh, uh, still stands. Um, it is uh, thanks to the efforts of our board, uh, it became designated as a National Historic Landmark uh, in 2014. And as I said, uh, we uh, were able to assemble the funds to purchase the property from the family last year. And we're in the midst of uh, renovating the property for public uh, visitation and use. And it's not only uh, the, the historic home, but also the 57-acre property will have trails and the ability for public access uh, to the Damascotta River. Um, so uh, I just was wondering, do, do any of you have any particular recollections of, of family stories about the, the New Deal? Or, or when did you first uh, hear or come across Francis Perkins as a, as a name in history? Well, you are not alone in not having heard of her before. Yeah. So what we what we are about is to continue to correct uh, that that omission in history. Yeah. Yes. Um, they certainly uh, knew each other, and uh, they um, were I in similar situations. Um, when, when FDR first uh, was elected president, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt had a bit of a challenge in figuring out what was the role of the First Lady and what was her responsibility when the country was in dire straits and her husband was taking the country through the first 100 days. Uh, Francis had worked for FDR in, uh, during his term as governor from 1928 to 1932. So they knew each other uh, in, in New York and New York society as well. Were they particularly close? Um, from time to time in, in matters of the presidential administration, and uh, and Francis Perkins would often be involved with different events, or um, in particular the uh, the nominating uh, conventions for each of Roosevelt's uh, terms uh, as president. Uh, but Francis was a cabinet secretary and had her own portfolio of responsibilities. Whereas Eleanor um, had a much broader uh, and less well-defined uh, purpose, particularly as it related to, to policy. The ironic thing is that on the day that Roosevelt died, Francis Perkins' role in government essentially ended. Um, and she was um, appointed by Truman to serve on the Civil Service Commission really uh, as a courtesy to keep her in the government and to keep a government salary for the work that she had done for Roosevelt, but she was not going to continue uh, in the cabinet. Truman created his own. Eleanor all of a sudden became responsible for the Roosevelt legacy, uh, truly worldwide, uh, with her work with the United Nations and, uh, and, and, uh, and other efforts. Um, across the world. Um, Eleanor was a person during his administration who could travel far easier than Roosevelt could and often served as his uh, ambassador at, uh, all across the country. Um, and you heard in the, in the film the point of the administration was that, uh, well, it's uh, nothing to fear but fear itself. Um, happy days are here again. It's trying to pump up the spirit of the country after its most devastating 
economic catastrophe of, of the Great Depression and making the country and its citizens believe that we can recover from this. Um, both Eleanor and Francis uh, had key roles in that. Yes. Well, the question uh, is, is about how did Francis work uh, to resolve uh, the issues around the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. What Perkins did, which was her, her habit, was to convene all parties, all interested parties, to the table. And that included uh, organizations representing labor. It included insurance companies. It included business uh, building owners, and it included the factory operators themselves. All of them were at the table with the recognition that this cannot happen again in New York. This just simply cannot happen. And we all have to come to particular agreement about a number of issues in order to move forward. And by bringing those different parties to the table, she was able to broker um, an acceptable way forward. It's in no one's interest uh, to have a factory destroyed and to have lives lost, um, but the economic tradition of, you know, you manufacture something, you want to manufacture it at the cheapest cost to sell at the highest price. Well, you don't get to do everything the cheapest way anymore. You need to put in uh, precautions and you need to put in regard for the workers and their lives. They're not just a piece of machinery. So that's, that's how she approached that. Uh, anyone else? Well, I would just conclude by saying uh, Please keep uh, exploring um, Frances Perkins and her life. Uh, we have noticed a, a real uptick in interest in Frances Perkins and uh, New Deal programs in particular because the current administration is calling attention to it and uh, beginning to implement some of the sim uh, similar spirited programs in order to help us move forward um, in the 21st century. And there is something to be learned from how government needs to evolve given uh, the conditions that confront us. And we certainly have learned that in the last 14 months of, of COVID-19. And the Francis Perkins Center remains uh, uh, closed uh, to general open hours uh, we have a very small exhibit center in Damascotta, but we will uh, uh, meet uh, interested visitors uh, in advance by reservation and appointment um, at the center. The Francis Perkins Homestead itself, we're in the midst of the renovation, so that property is not open in 2020, but we plan to open early next year for visitation by the general public. Um, well, thank you all very much. Appreciate it.